We're excited to uh, present our first uh, exceptional founder group, but more importantly, the company has a very ambitious vision and is one of two investments we made in foundational models. So it essentially is developing its own foundational model and the vision is to democratize the development uh, and creation of software. And they're gonna do that obviously by enhancing software development and one day hopefully getting super intelligence and software development where you can just use natural language to produce any kind of software and improve it. Um, and the founders, Jason and ISO, uh, we feel very fortunate to be able to partner with them. Uh, Jason was uh, formerly CTO of GitHub. He was VP of engineering in Heroku. ISO actually uh, started uh, two companies, including Athenian and Source, uh, which are again, all in this space. So when you hear more from them, you'll understand why we got so excited. And all their backgrounds and careers uh, led them to here and they're meant to build this amazing company. So I'm gonna actually give the stage to ISO, who's gonna start with the demo. Just to set the stage, I'm gonna take a moment uh, because one of the things that I wanted to bring up, not only was this the biggest check, but the company is barely two years old, probably not even. And when I met Jason and ISO, uh, there was no team, no product, an amazing vision, amazing talent, uh, and hardly anything. And in fact, one of the scariest parts of it was what needs to happen in the future for this company to even have a chance of realizing this mission and being successful. And yet, uh, barely a couple months after that, this round is essentially a testament to what Jason and ISO have been able to achieve in just mere months, like an amazing team, already amazing pilots, uh, much more interesting stuff that you're gonna hear about from the company regarding how insane their business development and sales growth is gonna be. Uh, and how, how much closer they're getting to their vision by also having access to one of the largest compute clusters. And I've never seen a company, including I was the first product manager of Google, that could implement their vision, be so sharply focused and do that. But maybe a good place to start is you have the perfect background for this, but can you maybe like recap again for the audience why software development, why is this one of the most interesting places to build a foundation model and to start this company? Um, I'll start. You finish. Um, so I think that this is, uh, so th there's a couple different ways you can look at this. If you look at this purely from an economic perspective, think about the TAM, the software development, what we have today, but what's possible in the future. We, we heard Stasia mention 100 million developers. That's what we talk about at GitHub. But what happens when 100 million turns into 8 billion? What happens when every line of code on the planet could be affected by AI as opposed to human intelligence? So that's, I mean, just think about that from a, a dollar's perspective. And you know, let's just to get greedy for a second and yeah. say, well, that's a really big market. But that is great. There's a lot of companies that can affect dollars. Good founder companies can be built in a lot of different categories. But when you're talking about societal impact, there's not very many. And software is the one that's going to affect society in a, in a very specific way. Now, there's also a very technical reason why software. And I think it's really important that we highlight this because this is also the technical reason is our escape velocity. So when it comes to, so why don't you jump into that, ISO? So about two years ago, uh, almost to the day, ChatGPT launched. And if you remember the following six months in the world was AGI is around the corner, GPT-5 is coming out, you know, and, and the whole world is going to change in the next 18 you know, months. And we're now two years later, actually more than two and a half years later since GPT-4 finished training, and that hasn't happened. And when we started Poolside, we knew that wasn't going to happen because for a very simple reason. What is happening in the training of large language models and auto, essentially autoregressive models in general is when we have extremely large scale web data, and we compress it into these models, we see intelligence being created, we see generalization. And what has happened when we've compressed the internet, we've seen incredible understanding of language. We've seen things that computers could never do before, and it's unlocking a lot of these new categories. But we haven't seen great multi-step complex reasoning. They're useful at coding, and they can provide 20, 30% productivity boosts, but we haven't seen them to be able to build software like we do as humans. And the premise of that is, is that the web actually misses two massive data sources that are at that large scale. Those models are incredible at learning, but they're far more inefficient than us, right? Magnitudes order more data is required. Now, the reason I'm starting out with this is because most data in the world at that scale is almost impossible to gather, right? The internet has taken quite a bit of time and a large number of people have built it up. And the data sets that are missing of the thought that went into the code that was created. It's data set number one. We don't give a task and instantly write code. There's actually reasoning and thinking before. And secondly, 
when we write code, if we would have hit enter to run that code, it would have given us an error potentially. We would have actually added statements. We would have run tests and we would have gone back and forth. Now, the reason I mention this is that coding is interacting with a deterministic system. It's not unlike learning how to play chess or how to play Go. You have to play the game to get feedback from when you're correct and when you're wrong. And this is really the insight around poolside. When you have data and a skill that you're looking to learn that is deterministic, you can simulate it. Go back to 2016. This is what DeepMind did with AlphaGo. It managed to simulate its way out of itself by letting the AI play against itself. Elon on the other end had to put millions of cars on the road to gather real world data to make highly capable full self-driving. But the head fake in all of this is that coding is a lot more like playing Go because it's deterministic. And that's what allows us to essentially use compute to escape this data, lim data limitation and to build more capable models. So we call this technique reinforcement learning via code execution feedback and it's the basis for our data generation from this, our synthetic data generation as well as complex reasoning and planning that's going into software. Now this is, this is not one of those things where it, we implement it and then the next day it's done. This is one of those things that builds over the course of, of years as we build these, these data sets up and build more and more complex and capable models. And I think Sundeep and both Aiden said this already, model capabilities are going to improve and increase. That's the key thing here is we got to keep pushing the limits on those. That's why we exist. We're pushing it through software. Once we hit that limit in software, that we'll, we'll hit what we call AGI for the, the domain of software. Then we move on to the general, the general other categories. We can see what we can do from software and jump over to general reasoning. Because reasoning, just like with humans, if you're really good reasoning in software, you should have reasonably good reasoning in other domains. So the key is, though, to make these neural networks think, essentially. I'm going to shift gears and maybe combine the next two questions together. One of the other assumptions in this is like people look at Microsoft and OpenAI and think, oh, the incumbents already have a business that's pretty large. What would a newcomer potentially do? And yet, in the board meeting we just had a couple of days ago, uh, again, I can't disclose it here, but it was one of the most impressive customer and pilot lists. So I, I think the two questions on our LPs' minds is number one, maybe couple articulation of like interesting modes and why you have a really great chance to make a dent. Uh, and then number two is, you know, maybe a little bit on the business model. Uh, so I think it's important that we talk about where ISO and I met for this part. Because I, we, we, ISO and I met in 2017 when I joined GitHub and I tried to buy Sourced to combine it with GitHub because we had a, a view of the world that should shape. And part of that view was that with this coming wave of AI that every company in the world is going to have to transform itself at some point. And you're gonna to have to make a decision whether or not you're looking at AI as uh, an augmentation or kind of fundamental and existential to the business. And our view was that we should partner with companies to help them understand that to make it past this wave, this is existential. Every company in the world really should think this way. Now I think um, you know, the premise of Poolside outside of the technical side as well is that we're gonna work with those companies to show them that you don't wanna build your forever home on two year lease back land. And that's essentially the premise. We're saying we've got the world's best um, AI for software development, we're gonna give it to you. We're gonna let you fine tune it on your premise. It's, it's gonna be hyper secure, hyper private, hyper compliant. We're not gonna see your data because we don't need to because we can generate a way out of the data conundrum. Um, and you now control your own destiny. And I mean, every company in the world doesn't wanna give their data to Microsoft. Nobody wants to give their data to Microsoft. So you know, we're starting to see that uptake. People are starting to realize that this is really where their time should be spent, their energy should be focused. And, and where Jason's answer is really on what we're seeing on the ground with the enterprises we work on. We have an entire enterprise ICP. We work with Global 2000, 5,000 developers and above. At the high level from the investor point of view, Microsoft is a 10,000 pound gorilla in the back of the corner of the room that probably most people here have seen this Slack versus Microsoft Teams adoption chart where you know, Slack was an the best product, but completely t you know, essentially eaten by Microsoft's distribution channel. And that for us was something from day zero we knew we needed to solve for. We kind of took a very simple approach. We said, well, who is larger than Microsoft in the cloud business? Well, it's Amazon. And we spent whew, a good four or five months with the senior leadership of Amazon, hundreds of hours. Uh, and we inked what hasn't happened since Databricks in our industry, what's called a first party relationship. Meaning, and for those of you who notice about Databricks, Databricks is zero to 200 million 
went through Microsoft because it sold on Microsoft's paper. The sales cycle wasn't a new startup having to come into an enterprise and figuring out how to buy Databricks. It was they're just adding, buying another service from Microsoft that happened to be Databricks. Now we did exactly the same thing with AWS. AWS in its history has only done this with VMware and NetApp. And what it means is that our go-to-market today is very, very closely linked together with the largest cloud provider in the world. And so our team has built up a very impressive pipeline. But combining that with AWS means that it becomes incredibly quick for enterprises to buy us. But it also means that the AWS sales team gets entirely retired on their quota in the same way they would from another Amazon product. So I think if you are going far with AI, knowing the massive resource requirements that are, exist in this space, knowing the massive competitive landscape, it really comes down to the classic quote, which I think was attributed to Marie Antoinette, of, you know, you want to go far, you, uh, well, actually, now I'm mixing it up, the go alone. Uh, yeah, if you want to go far, go alone. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Exactly. And, and, and this is exactly it. This is, and so this has been an incredible relationship. I think it's been very rare to have seen this happen in, the, in, in tech. I can't think of anyone else but Databricks who's done this. And it's allowing us a massive acceleration in our go-to-market. And talking about partnerships, I think I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit, but one of the really important things that ILPs always have to assert is, hey, these really great companies, why do they choose you? Why do they choose Felicis? And I think one of the things that makes my team more proud, more than returns, more than anything else, is to be able to have early faith in like amazing companies where nobody else maybe will have the conviction. But I would love to hear from both of you, maybe sure. just a few things that, that might have stood our partnership apart from anybody else. Yeah. So you could imagine. So I was, a, I was at Redpoint Ventures for two years. I, some of you all are in Redpoint as well. Um, and I'm still involved with Redpoint. Um, and you can imagine the former CTO of GitHub rolling out and kind of doing something, what would happen in the Valley. You've seen it from other AI companies as well and other people rolling out OpenAI or whatnot. And um, when you're building a company, fast money versus smart money, is a, it, it, there's a very big difference in there. And I'm old enough, as you can see from my hair, that I don't need to worry about fast money. I need to worry about smart money. I have less years left than before me in this way. So my criteria, which was different than ISO's, but similar was, hey, we're gonna raise all the money we want. We're building something interesting and unique and it's, um, once people understand it, that even, even the fast money is gonna come later. So we'll just ask them why. Don't tell them why we're doing it. Let's ask them why they want in. And when you hear a smart answer that might, is at least as close to yours, if not better, you gotta take them seriously. So when we asked Iden and Sandeep, why? You heard it here. These are the, our words are similar to theirs, but this was two years ago, and it was great. Done. Let's. There, you are our lead. I, I take a view on this that the people who matter most in your cap table need to follow exactly the same criteria of the people you hire. And when we built Poolside, we said we want kind-hearted, low ego, massively ambitious, extremely high intellectual horsepower and people who deeply care about their work and who work as hard as investment bankers. <laughs> and, and that's been our culture inside our company. And frankly, once we met Aiden, it didn't require a lot of time for us to understand that Aiden pretty much represents all those exact same categories. And then we got to meet the broader team. And then we realized this wasn't just an Aiden quality, it was actually a fun culture. And frankly, yeah, we've just been very, very glad that you made a bet on us early on. No, thank you. I mean, thank you for making us look good, honestly. Uh, <laughs> our job is very simple. Once you pick the right companies, you just you know, kind of watch the rocket like, uh, take, take flight. Thank you so much. Really great to have you here.